so CCA is a place that invites diverse voices to their program, like Joseph said. And uh, we reflect all walks of life and experience at this school. So now I'd like to invite you to get ready for David Mitchell. Here's what Jeff von Ward has to say about David. David writes like the love child of J.R.R. Tolkien and Woody Allen in a world where swordplay and sexual humiliation frequently coexist. <laughs> Placing a poultice on our psychic wounds with his wit and grace. Oh, and he knows a lot more about dinosaurs than you do. <laughs> David Mitchell. Hi, everyone. Um, standing up here right now, I realize that my debts are innumerable, but to keep them confined to just one page. First, I thank God for creating and sustaining the universe, sending down his only begotten son to redeem mankind, etc., and for the incredible fortunate opportunities I've had in my life, which have combined to bring me here right now. Second, I thank Reverend William Buckland for introducing the first known dinosaur to the world and for living a life interesting enough to inspire my fiction. Third, I thank Walter Trail Dennison for single-handedly saving the entire body of Orcadian folklore from extinction. But on a more recent and less abstract note, I am indebted in no small part to the support of my parents, who, who cannot be here tonight, but without whom I would not have been able to survive one semester here in San Francisco. My profound thanks also goes to Dr. Gerald Walker, the author of the book Street Shadows, a memoir of race, rebellion, and redemption for seeing potential in me that when I did not fully recognize it in myself, without him I would most assuredly not be standing here right now. For first helping me to expand my horizons with their keenness and honesty, I thank Dodie Bellamy and Kevin Killian. For pointing me in the right direction on more than one occasion, I thank Hugh M. Steinberg. For his invaluable insight, patience, and enthusiasm, I thank Cooley Windsor. For his immense generosity, support, and discernment, I thank Matthew Erebarn for her indefatigable dedication towards helping my writing reach its potential and for convincing me to delete all of my ex's emails from my Yahoo account. I thank Anne Marino. <laughs> for supplying that wonderful introductory quote, I thank Jeff Von Ward. For being a good friend, I thank Scott Allen. And for hypnotizing me with their unexpected grace and beauty, I thank the newts in the Japan pool at the Berkeley Botanical Gardens. <laughs> and now I'll begin. Early November of 1849, death and disease hung over the cold air of Westminster. Europe had been ravaged by revolution the previous year, Ireland by famine, and London by an epidemic of cholera. All of the sewers in London, crumbling from their centuries-old brickwork, flowed straight into the Thames like a gigantic digestive tract. Those with less money, the paupers, bagmen, rat catchers, and costerbungers, could be similarly blessed with free baptisms from the occasional chamber pot upended out of an open window. And so the festering carrion of the old age remained to be cannibalized by the new, the ravenous, the stronger, where past demons returned to leave the world a teetering ruin, and woe betide all mediators. William Buckland, the dean of Westminster Abbey, knew all about past demons. Buckland and his colleagues had spent the decades showing the world that the earth once teemed with hideous saurian monsters that swam through the sea, wandered the land, and even flew through the air. He was convinced that these monsters were not the work of Satan, but the work of God. He was certain that the earth was much older than suggested in Genesis. His academic circle was entirely in agreement, enough to award him with the Wollaston Medal, but conservatives at Oxford were now in the ascendancy, and establishing a separate honors school for the natural sciences became a futile and dispiriting task. Life at Westminster was preferable. The 65-year-old professor's responsibilities are now tenfold what they were when he left Oxford, but his skills could be put to better use. In addition to looking over Westminster's school, over the souls of his parishioners, the minds and well-beings of the boys, and the occasional trip back to Oxford to teach his geology, the dean had superintended all the major renovations. He was averaging only four hours of sleep each night, and he still entertained guests for dinner. Dean Buckland could be seen on a chilly late afternoon inspecting the statues in the gloomy halls of the South Cloister, wearing his black Geneva robe. Healing at his side was a young black bear, muzzled and leashed. Dean Buckland smiled and greeted every servant and monk he passed. All returned their smiles, but with less certainty. 
They had all been told before he arrived that the dean was eccentric, but no one dared question the menagerie of animals he and his family brought from Oxford. An eagle was tethered at a pole in the dean's yard, a monkey similarly tethered in the kitchen, and if the servants were not careful enough whilst wandering the deanery, their heels might have been nipped by a free-roaming jackal. When Buckland stopped to examine the weather statue of Madonna, he drew forth a light feathered brush and gingerly removed the dust that had settled on her nose and fingers. The bear was small, but on his hind legs, he nearly reached the dean's height. What do you think, Tig? The dean asked. Will the Blessed Mother survive another two centuries? Tiglath looked at Buckland with sad eyes, then lowered his front paws to the ground. When the bear lowered himself, Buckland saw, in her gray dress and bonnet-covered head, Mrs. Burroughs. She was a dignified and tight-lipped middle-aged woman with impeccable posture. Having served in Westminster for thirty years, she stopped within, 30, within ten feet of the dean as he heartily patted the bear on his neck and shoulders. Very reverend, she said. There's a man here to see you. He came in through the west door. Buckland turned to Mrs. Burroughs. His balding hair was grayish-white and his sideburns were prominent. He had a round, almost cherubic face, and his eyes always seemed to be smiling. He ran his fingers through the bear's thick black fur. Then he has a name, he said. Angus Errol Norn, she said. Mr. Cleghorn is fetching him now. Excellent. Mrs. Burroughs departed, and moments later she returned in the company of two other men. To her right was Mr. Cleghorn, the dean's butler and former member of the Metropolitan Police. He was a tall and burly man dressed in a fancy coat, knee breeches, stockings, and powdered hair. The man next to him was shorter and not nearly as well dressed. He had wavy chestnut hair that protruded from underneath his Belmoral bonnet, and he wore modest side whiskers. He wore a layered black cape, underneath a stiff neckband, a waistcoat, and a cravat. The tall boots and gaiters he wore over his tights were muddied. He held in his hand a cane at his side, clenching the handle as though it were a sword. His pale face bore indistinct scars, and his blue eyes looked awash in some distant agony. The man looked startled when Mr. Cleghorn gestured to the dean. He instantly removed his hat. Mr. Angus Norn, the great Orcadian trapper, Buckland explained. Any friend of Lord Harcourt is a friend of mine. I'm so pleased to meet someone with real experience regarding this new specimen we found. Edwin Buckland? Angus said with a terse nod. His eyes darted toward the bear, and Buckland switched the leash to his left hand and extended his arm for a handshake. The bear stood up. This is Tiglath Pileser, said Buckland. I've had him since he was six months old. He's a tame friend, you know. He's excellent at wine parties, especially if you provide him with a cap and gown. Just don't try to hypnotize him. Right, Tig? The bear placed his front paws on the ground again, and noting Angus's incredulous expression, the dean let out a wicked laugh. Forgive me, Reverend, Angus said. It gave me quite a flag for a moment. I see he answers you well. I was told you were a professor of uh, geology. The very first at Oxford, the dean chuckled. I prefer the term undergroundology myself. I, I thought it meant something like that. Ever since I looked at the Cliffs of Lyme, they were my geological school. They stared me in the face. They wooed me and caressed me, saying at every turn, pray, pray, be a geologist. Angus, this concerns an odd specimen from Orkney which has recently come to my possession. Not a fossil specimen, mind you, but something a little more well-preserved. Something more akin to the Stronze beast. I have heard of that, said Angus. A huge stinking monster carcass washed up on the shore of Stronze, September 25th, 1808. They thought it was a sea serpent. Or Connie bears plesiosaurs, but yes, I'm impressed, Angus. It's easy for me to remember, Reverend, because I was born that day. The first ten years of my life were spent on Stronze. When you're under the shadow of a monster, people tend to forget you. Yes, well, it seems that the Westernian Natural History Society in Edinburgh has recently examined that specimen and it determined it to be a Baskin shark, which doesn't surprise me in the slightest. But what does surprise me is that the society, being in decline now, has recently sold off their assets to a multitude of private collectors down here in England. And among them was one rather peculiar specimen from another place in Orkney. This one hasn't been labeled. This is where I'm wondering, perhaps, if you could be of help? Angus's face froze, then he remained silent for a moment. The dean watched him intently, not knowing if he'd unintentionally invented the man. The Orcadians he'd been told were an unusual lot. They were shy and reserved. Angus's eyes darted around into the shadows of the cloisters before settling back on Buckland. Please stay a while. The cooks have prepared a banquet. There's no sense in letting it all go to waste. Though I should warn you, um, our meal is something of an acquired taste. Perhaps you could indulge me over dinner? I'm a hunter, Reverend, not a naturalist. I'm not likely to be of much help to you. Angus, I hear you're seeking employment with the Harcourt family as their game warden. Aye, Angus said uneasily. We just arrived from Canada. The wife is pregnant again, and I'd really rather settle in one place this time. We've lost too many children already. 
I'm on good terms with the Harcourt family, as you know. Not only will I reimburse you for your time, I'll write them a letter on your behalf. Angus looked uncomfortably silent again before finally steeling himself and nodding. He looked at Dean Buckland straight in the eyes with a boyish respect. He reminded Buckland of one of those younger parishioners. If you would do that, Reverend, he said softly, I would be grateful. Buckland gestured to Cleghorn to lead them southward through the cloister. He hoped their dalliance might put his guest's mind at ease. Let me show you the deanery, said Buckland. Since you're right between the Thames and the lake, which was once a swampy creek, this is, to my delight, a peninsula of the purest sand and gravel, as you will still see in the foundations of the abbey, near the new graves in the churchyard of St. Margaret's. It all reminds me a little of St. Magnus, said Angus as he glanced around. But it's owned by the Kirk. Forgive me again, Reverend, but since I've not been keeping track, I don't know the differences between the Church of England and the Church of Rome. I don't know the differences either, laughed the dean. At least when I read Newman's tracts, that's what they all want taught at Oxford now. I would suggest that what qualifies is that we have yet to canonize mermaids or sanctify goat bones. Eh? Oh, back in 1826, when my wife and I were visiting the shrine in Palermo, I was rather unimpressed by the bones exhibited as belonging to St. Rosalia, as they were clearly those of a goat. When I pointed this out to the priest, they told us that the saint would not allow me to see it was only visible to the faithful. The faithful. Toward England or toward Rome? Tiglath snorted. Cleghorn sharply turned a corner in the passage, and the dean and his, and his guest followed. I'm no doubt in the Lord's power and grace, Reverend, said Angus. But of all I've experienced in my life, I didn't feel completely at home in any kirk. And the stains on the flagstones, martyr's blood, they said. I'll tell you what it was, Angus. It was bat urine. How did you know that, Reverend? It tasted of bat urine. I've eaten my way through the entire animal kingdom, you know, from mouse to buffalo. Even in the realm of taste, I trust you'll find there is a consistent pecking order to creation, with the mole in the blue bottle ranking dead last, toasted mice and the hedgehog somewhere near the top, and the crocodile middling low. Buckland turned to Angus and noticed a slight look of horror on the man's face. He laughed again. Reverend, he said slowly, I appreciate your hospitality, and I thank you for the invitation, but that's not why I came here. I came here to warn you about that thing from Orkney. Get rid of it. I beg your pardon? It's difficult to explain, Reverend, but please trust me when I say you need to get rid of that thing. Are we talking about the same specimen here, Angus, the severed form? I know what you're talking about, Reverend. I didn't want to see it again or even speak of it much. Then you must have a story to tell. I if I'm going to do something as drastic as toss away such an intriguing and well-preserved specimen, I'd at least like an explanation. Angus tightened his lips and looked uncomfortably at Cleghorn and then back at the grassy yard in the middle of the cloister. It's a story I hate telling, but if that's what it will take to convince you, I'll share it. Then, please, for the love of St. Magnus, get rid of it. I'm begging you. No good will come from having it in this place. Thank you.